So the term is rapidly approaching its end. Uh, believe it or not, there's only two weeks left. And there's only two topics left in this course. So I'm going to violate our regular schedule a little bit. Uh, there's going to be two lectures in a row on atoms and photons. So that's today and Wednesday. And then Friday, you will get the homework assignment. And then there will be one more topic and one more homework assignment next week. And then during finals week, I'll give you exam three. More about that next week. Um, but for now, the topic atoms and photons. And of course, photons, the particles of light. We talked about this last lecture quite a bit. Um, talking about it a bit more here. Uh, so just this is the a review here. What is a photon? It's the particle of light. So we, we say that light comes in waves, electromagnetic waves, right? We spent most of the semester working up the theory of electromagnetism. And light is an electromagnetic wave, but light also is a particle. And so the wave particle duality means sometimes it behaves like a wave and sometimes it behaves like a particle. Really, it is what it is. It is what it is. And we're sort of making analogies to particle like and wave like behavior um, when we make those analogies. But you know, it helps us think about it. So a photon is the smallest amount of energy you can have in light of a given frequency. So a specific frequency, which for visible light corresponds to a specific color. Um, at minimum, you can have one photon, and you can only have an integral number of photons. The energy of one photon is this energy here, hc over lambda, where c is the speed of light, and then lambda is the wavelength of that photon, and h is Planck's constant, which is a very small number. So photons have no mass, but they do carry energy, and they do carry momentum. It should not surprise you that they carry energy, because you know that if you shine light on things, there's there's energy going to it. You can, And if it's infrared light, you can feel the heat. There's energy there. Um, but it might surprise you that photons do carry momentum. Even though there's no mass, it is possible for them to carry momentum. So that's kind of a fun thing. Well, all right, so that's photons. Particle of light. We talked before that about wave of light. Sort of the modern theory of, of the basic things is this thing called quantum field theory, which sounds very scary. But and, and quantum field theory is the kind of thing that physics majors usually don't even see until they're graduate students. So obviously, we're not going to delve into the depths of quantum field theory here. But I want to give you a little bit of an idea about sort of the big broad overview of how it describes the world. Um, so the electromagnetic field is one of the fields that are, is described in quantum field theory. Um, in fact, quantum electrodynamics is the name of the quantum field theory of uh, the electromagnetic field. And it was um, also includes electrons, right? So anyway, so the electromagnetic field is a field theory that quantum field theory talks about. And in the language of quantum field theory, the photon is a, a quantized excitation of the electromagnetic field. What does that mean? So first of all, remember a field is just something that is a function of position. That's all the word field means. When you hear the word field, it just means function of position. So when we say the electromagnetic field, that means everywhere in space, there is a value, a vector value at that point in space of the electric field and of the magnetic field. Everywhere in space, there's a value of that. That's what it means to be a field. Well, here's a simpler field in this image here. We're going to say the height field of the lake. So instead of E vector as a function of X, Y, and Z, we'll just have the height as a function of X and Y. So where are you on the surface of the lake? You could imagine, um, you know, suppose instead of a lake, it was a pool with a nice flat bottom and you could put a grid on it. And that's where X and Y is, where you are horizontally. Um, and you'll notice here, this height field is mostly very smooth and flat. It's a nice reflecting, smooth, flat, unexcited um, field. But over here on the side, um, and what causes the excitation? Ducks. So ducks are to water as charges are to the electric field. Um, you can see there's some ripples, waves on the surface of the water. And so that would be considered an excitation of the height field because, and there's energy in waves, right? Go and stand in the ocean and get knocked over by waves and you'll understand that waves can carry energy. Um, so there's energy in those waves there. Um, so it's an excitation of the height field carries energy. Well, so the same idea is that um, light, when you perceive light, it's excitations of the electromagnetic field, and those excitations propagate as waves. Now, quantized excitations, it turns out in quantum field theory that when you excite these various things, you can't excite it any amount, but you excite it in steps 
of the quantum of that field. The photon is the quantum of the electromagnetic field. Now, so, and again, this is a little weird because you could just have make the waves however low amplitude or however low frequency you wanted on the surface of this lake. So it's not like, and it's not like with, if you were stacking baseballs in a bin, you have one baseball or two baseballs. You don't have half a baseball. You're not allowed to cut baseballs up. Um, that's a crime against humanity. Um, so that's obvious that that's quantized, but with, with waves, you know, you can just make it a little stronger, a little weaker. So why are they quantized? Well, it turns out there is one case um, where you can think of where, where it makes sense that waves might be quantized. And that's imagine you have a string that is anchored at both ends and then the string is vibrating, right? And so uh, it can vibrate such that the wavelength of the sine wave it makes is actually twice the distance, or it could vibrate such that exactly one wavelength fits. Or it could vibrate so that one and a half wavelengths fit, or it could vibrate so that exactly two wavelengths fit, so on and so forth. But if the string is anchored at both ends, it has to have an integral number of half wavelengths, because otherwise the part at the end would be trying to flap up and down, and that just doesn't work. So this is an example of a place where only specific frequencies, now this is different, right? With photon, you're going to have any old frequency. But with these, only specific wavelengths fit, all right? And so then these wavelengths of this string would correspond to the energy of, um, of a sort of, correspond to the energy of a particle in quantum field theory. So the quantized excitations are analogous to the fact that you can only get quantized wavelengths in this wave on a string that's fixed at both ends. And so, so that's the fundamental picture, and it's a really weird picture. Why would you even talk about it this way? Well, because it predicts a whole bunch of stuff that shows up in uh, experiments. So it's a theory that seems to work, but it's really counterintuitive. It's much, you know, you think about a baseball, and it's flying through the air, and it's got a position and a velocity, and that makes sense. Um, if you want to then talk about the baseball field, and there's an exit, well, okay, baseball fields, you know what those are. Um, but I don't mean that. I mean, the, the so instead of a baseball, think of a, a rock or a marble, right? There's the marble field. And when you have a marble, it's an excitation of the marble field. Not that there is now a marble there, but oh no, the marble field is exciting and there's ripples moving through the marble field. And those ripples we perceive to be an object we call a marble, but really it's just, oh, it's a quantized excitation of the marble field. Huh. Kind of a weird way of talking about things, but that is kind of the quantum field theory way of talking about things. Well, all right, so we're not going to really go into much more depth with that. But here's the key that comes out of this quantum field theory is that um, the particle wave duality is right there, right? It's fields. Um, it's a continuous function of position, and you excite it by having disturbances that propagate through it like waves. There's wave behavior. But those disturbances are quantized. You either have a baseball or you don't. You stack an integral number of baseballs into your... Um, in where you're putting baseballs. That's particle-like behavior. So the wave-particle duality is built in to quantum field theory. So that's sort of why I bring it up. So let's come back to photons and light energy. Um, so photons, again, here's the equation for the energy of a photon. Um, a few things, photons of longer wavelength have lower energy. You can just see that from the equation, right? If I divide by a bigger lambda, so H and C are both constant. So if I divide by a bigger lambda, I get a smaller E. Right? That's how the equation just tells you that. So lambda does tell you what the energy of a single photon is, but it does not tell you the intensity of a light beam. The intensity of a light beam depends not only on the wavelength of each photon and therefore the energy of each photon, but on how many you're, you're getting, right? It's the same thing with baseballs, right? How, um, how hard does it hurt to be hit by baseballs? Well, if you have somebody throwing 100 mile an hour baseballs at you and they throw one, it's really bad. But suppose you have five pitchers all together, all throwing it at the same time and you get hit by five all at once, that's worse. Um, so this energy is the energy of one photon. It does not directly correspond to the intensity of a light wave. And then electromagnetic waves, which is what uh, we talked about last time, sort of the, the pinnacle of the electromagnetic theory talked about is, hey, look, it, magnetic induction and the corresponding changing magnetic fields give electric fields lead to waves propagating. Well, that's the classical description. Uh, the classical description doesn't know anything about photons. Well, the classical description works really well when there's lots and lots and lots of photons, which is what happens most of the everyday time. But um, one of the times that doesn't happen is when 
uh, light is interacting with atoms, as we talked about last time with the photoelectric effect. I want to go into an aside here. You know, what is physics? Physics is hard. That's not the right answer. In fact, what is science in general? So you all have some idea what science is because uh, you're all science majors of some sort. But do you really know what science is? So what science is not is just a body of facts, right? So it's real tempting to say, oh, what is science? Oh, well, there's physics and chemistry and biology and geology and astronomy and uh, all these things. And then biology includes evolution. And there's, well, all right. Those are the fields, right? The, this, that's sort of our list of scientific knowledge. But that's not a fundamental basic description of what science is, really. That's just sort of an enumeration of lots of stuff that we have. And of course, um, the popular impression of science is probably just a collection of facts. And most people, when they learn science, just hear a bunch of facts and remember them. But science is more than that. Science is a process. Science is an approach to the world. Science is a, I mean, it's, it's a, an epistemological approach, whatever. But um, and what ultimately do we do? Well, I don't know about science in general, but this is often how physics works. Right? Science, this is probably not a broad enough description for science in general. But the way physics works, especially when we're talking about our, our basic theories like electromagnetism, is that we build models that allow us to explain, understand, and predict natural phenomena. Of course, building. What do I mean by build? Uh, we discover them. Well, do we discover them or do we invent them? There's could get into a long discussion there. Um, we refine them. We have models. Um, we can make them better so they work better. So what we do is we build models. And these models are um, conceptual constructs. So it's not like if you have a model car, you have a little a bunch of plastic all together that sort of looks like the car, right? It'd be a model car. Um, instead, what these models are, a set of equations and a set of prescriptions for how you use those equations that make predictions quantitative predictions about what would happen if you did certain experiments. Right? So the whole, all this stuff that we've talked about with electricity and magnetism all semester, that's all part of a model that describes how interactions of particles through electric and magnetic fields. Um, the model includes the basic equations that we have been talking about together with it fits in the framework of Newton's laws together with the concept of electric charge. Right? All those things, you put them all together, that gives us the model. You do calculations, you can then predict things like which way is the compass needle going to point? Or um, how much energy is going to be in the lightning bolt? You know, there's all kinds of stuff that you can predict. Um, magnetic induction, you can predict which way is the motor going to turn when you run current. Or if you turn the loop, which way will you get current? And then you can go and put a voltmeter on it and find out, oh, look, I got it in the way I expected. So the models are theoretical constructs, equations, and all that. We use them to predict experiments. Now, uh, and these in physics, these models are, are almost always mathematical. Um, and so that's that's the place where, you know, there's you can imagine scientific models that's not strictly mathematical, but it, you know, it turns out there's a lot of math in biology too. Um, uh, you know, not the same kinds of math necessarily as physics, but biology is becoming increasingly mathematical. Maybe it wasn't, 250 years ago or 150 years ago, but nowadays it certainly is. Well, all right, and now here's the final thing. Models usually have a restricted range of applicability, and this is where you can get into deep discussions about you know, truth versus um, just empirical, oh, this kind of works. Um, is there really such a thing as an electromagnetic field? And that's not even a question that I, as a scientist, am suited to answer. Go to philosophers for that kind of thing. And you'll come out, and I don't know. Anyway, it's hard. That's a hard question. Is there really an electromagnetic field? Well, what we do is we act as if there were an electric field, magnetic field, and we do calculations, and we can predict behaviors from it. So it's a very practical sort of thing. But the models usually have a restricted range of applicability outside of which they don't make good predictions. So, for example, the electromagnetic wave theory that we have does not make good predictions for light interacting with individual atoms, which means that this model can't be the whole truth because there are things that it would predict that are not right. But again, that's not really, we don't really claim that our models are truth with a capital T. We claim that our models are things that work for predicting things within a certain range. So the, the wave theory of light works, but not always. Now the quantum theory we think, you know, it's conceivable, 
that some of these quantum theories are truth with a capital T. The problem is predicting how a car will drive with quantum mechanics is prohibitively difficult. Um, so that's why we don't do it. We use classical physics for that because it works extremely well. So anyway, models usually do have a restricted range of applicability, and if you know, outside that, they do not make good predictions. And then finally, there's this word theory, which, of course, in everyday parlance, theory means um, speculation, but that's not what it means at all in science, right? So people hear evolution is just a theory. Well, no, evolution, the theory of evolution is a um, under pinning concept of all of modern biology. It's, it's a theory because it is a, a model, it is a conceptual description um, of a way to understand reality. It doesn't mean we just kind of made it up and we don't really know that it's right. Um, right? Evolution works extremely well and there's all kinds of evidence that it explains and it's made all kinds of predictions that we then found things for, right? So it's not just crap that somebody made up. So, so when we say a theory, well, what do we really mean? Actually, really, Model and theory may be synonyms, um, not always, and there's all kinds of nuance in physics and astronomy, at least, when we use the word model. Sometimes what we mean is a toy version of a real theory that we're using to make simple predictions in a simple case or something like that. But, you know, is it is it the electromagnetic model, the electromagnetic theory? Eh, maybe they're the same words. When we say a theory, really, it just means one of these models, one of these conceptual and mathematical frameworks that we've built that makes predictions. So anyway, that's the end of the side. Um, let's go back. We want to talk about this wave-particle duality thing. And specifically, what is wave-like behavior? Um, well, so think about that, that pond we looked at earlier. And the waves aren't right at one spot, right? Waves have to be spread out. And if they're, if they're all exactly at one point, you can't tell that they're a wave because there's nowhere for it to be different. The whole point of a thing of a wave is it's different at different places. So waves, by their nature, are spread out. One of the things wave can do, waves can do is interfere with each other. So imagine you have two electromagnetic waves, or two any kinds of waves. These could be two waves on a string. These could be two waves on the surface of water. Imagine that you have two waves. Um, to, you know, so you've got two sources, two you know, light beams, right next to each other. And suppose those waves are exactly the same wavelength, and suppose they're exactly lined up. So on the top here, what I've done, so the little dotted lines show that you've got two waves right next to each other. Really, they're supposed to be on top of each other, but I, so that you could see that there were two, I drew them, I offset them a little bit so you can see that. And they're perfectly lined up. What happens when you have two wave sources creating two waves like that? The resultant wave um, is just double the amplitude. So you can get um, two waves can build on each other, um, and you get, you know, so what? you get something that's brighter like that. Um, on the other hand, you can also have waves um, interfere with each other in what's called destructive interference. And so now if you look at the top, I've got my two waves, right? One, so if you look carefully at the, uh, the blanking out in the, uh, actually it's really hard to see, but if you look at those little dotted lines, you can see that, that where they cross zero, they're lined up with each other. Um, one of the waves, is in front, one's in back, but they're really supposed to be on top of each other. If those two waves are on top of each other, and why would this be? This might be because um, you had two, uh, you know, you're on water and you had two people splashing water at different sides. If the two waves have exactly the same wavelength, but they're out of phase, which means, so when they're in phase, that was the previous slide, the crests are lined up with the crests and the the valleys are lined up with the valleys. When they're out of phase, the crests are lined up of one or lined up with the valleys of the other. They sum to nothing. And this really happens. You can really have two waves that when they go past each other, interfere and cancel each other out. Right? And so that's, that is classic wave-like behavior. Well, here's another piece of classic wave-like behavior and that's called diffraction. So if you look here, um, there's, there's a, some sort of lake or something off on the right, and there'll be waves coming in from the right. And then these two big stone uh, barrier things create like a narrow slit or a little passage between. And off to the left, you see these sort of circular pattern waves coming out um, there. And so that is the result of the waves diffracting through the little um, passage there. So whenever waves go through a narrow passage, and as long as the wavelength isn't incredibly tiny compared to the passage, if the wavelength is really, 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 really small compared to the passage, you won't even really be able to notice the diffraction. That's sort of like one side of the shore to the other. But here, you know, the wavelength, uh, it's, you know, 10 wavelengths or something looking at it would make up that little package, 
passage, uh, when they're closer like that, you get these diffraction effects where it looks like, you know, you get these sort of things circling out from those slits. And, and you can sort of approximate it as that little slit, that little opening there is a wave source for the waves on the left side. Really, though, it's just the waves on the right side coming and going through it, but then we can approximate it as a wave source. That is also wave-like behavior. And so we see we can see this doing what we call double slit diffraction in light. Um, and again, this is one of these things. I'm sad we don't have lab because we would have done this in lab and we would have seen this happen. We would have used lasers. Why lasers? Because they give us light that's exactly at one wavelength. They also give us light that's nicely collimated along a single direction. So it works really well for this. But you can see this with other kinds of light, too. We would have actually seen and measured these diffractions. You would have seen it in action. And now we don't have labs, so you don't really see it in action anymore. Um, but what happens? Come in, you get this diffracted light. So on the left, I've got incoming light, and then there's a screen, and then there's two little slits, two little holes in the screen that light can get through. And so uh, remembering back on the previous slide where you had waves, let's just say you had waves all coming in straight towards... Um, straight towards that barrier there, but notice coming out, since it's coming out in a circle, the waves are going in all directions, not just straight ahead. Well, here, we'll, let's just assume the waves can go in all directions. Turns out they can, but we'll go with it, see what happens, see if it works. So at some direction, so this dotted line is straight, straight ahead, at an angle theta to the dotted line, and then if the screen's a distance L away, um, this this diffraction light that ha whichever light is going in that direction and I'm not saying light must go in that direction it's going to go in all directions so this is just one of the directions we're considering right now it'll hit the screen a distance h think of height um, away from the center straight ahead of where the slits are and then of course theta is related to h and l because h over l is tangent theta but as long as theta is very small it turns out tangent theta and sine theta are almost exactly the same and both of them are very close to theta if you have theta and radians and that would happen if l is really big compared to h which is often the case certainly would have been in lab well so all right so what happens here so first of all let's just look at the two waves that go straight ahead so this would be the case where theta on the previous slide equals zero um, if the waves are all coming in coherently, and so that's where you use lasers because you get nice coherent light coming out of lasers, what that means is that, that they're all, all the, their peaks and valleys are all lined up with each other nicely. So you have two waves coming in coherently, and so they go through the slits, which are a distance d apart, and then you've got that wavelength lambda labeled there. And these two waves are in phase with each other, right? They're going straight ahead. Um, now, if they wanted to hit the point on the screen really, really far away, off L, off to the right, they couldn't actually be going straight ahead. They would have to be converging very slightly. But that angle is small enough um, that what we're going to do is we're going to approximate D is not really big compared to even H, so that uh, these two waves, by the time it gets to the screen, it's like they were exactly on top of each other. We won't worry, but that little extra angle is not going to mess us up too much. So these two waves are in phase... So going straight ahead, so if you look at what the light that's going off at angle theta equals zero, straight ahead towards the screen, the light in that direction is all in phase with itself. And so you should get a bright spot because things just line nicely up as they go straight ahead. Now let's go off at some other angle theta here, and I chose this angle theta very carefully. Um, I want you to notice along the direction that the light is going, these dotted lines show what part of one wave is lined up with what part of the other wave, um, perpendicular to the direction. And so then when they hit the screen very far away, and these two waves really, and this D, the kind of D we're talking about here is going to be really small, like fractions of a millimeter kind of distance D. So these waves look much farther apart than they really are. You've got these two waves, they're out of phase with each other. Along the direction they're traveling, you can see that one valley is lined up with the other's crest, and that means they will sum to nothing. And so along that direction, you shouldn't see anything. It's not, right? And so, and you can actually mathematically figure out what this is. What you need is for the wave to be out of phase is that one wave has to have a half wavelength head start on the other one. And that's what I'm trying to draw on the left here. You notice that the bottom wave because it had to go a little bit further, has a half wavelength head start, or either that or it's a half wavelength behind, maybe is whatever, it doesn't matter. What matters is where they're lined up. So because it had to go a little further, the two waves started at the slits together, but going off at this angle, 
because along that direction, you've got this little extra delta x that the bottom um, wave has to go. If that extra delta x is exactly equal to half a wavelength, that's exactly the right distance to put these waves out of phase along that direction. Right? So on the previous slide, the delta x was 0 because um, the direction was horizontal, and so perpendicular direction was vertical, and there's going to be no extra distance out of the slit. But back on this slide, here, that little extra distance that the bottom wave has to go, so putting it behind, is exactly half a wavelength, which puts it out of phase. So at this angle, when sine theta, or really approximately theta, is equal to delta x over d, when that delta x over d is equal to lambda over 2d, right? So when delta x is lambda over 2, you expect to have a minimum. So lambda is the wavelength. So take the wavelength of light, divide it by twice the distance between your two slips. You expect to have a dark spot there. There will be no light. And then if you go further, now um, I'm going to let the, the bottom wave be a full wavelength behind the top wave, right? Because it has a full distance delta x equals lambda extra to go. And what that means is, is that um, because it's a full wavelength behind, its next crest is lined up with the previous crest of the top wave. So they're back in phase again. And so they should add up together, right? The, the, the sum, the positive sum with the positives, the negative sums with the negatives, it'll make a bigger wave. You should have a bright spot again, right? And that'll happen when sine theta is lambda over D. And so the, the result is, and what's on this next thing, you have incoming light on the left. On the right, I have plotted the intensity as sort of a horizontal band. So you can think of, um, instead of its photons, sand grains. And as the sand grains hit the screen, they pile up. This would be the piles. The bumps to the left would be the piles of the sand grains. But really, it's um, it's just the what, what does the brightness look like as a function of position. Um, and the maxima are going to happen whenever the how the degree to which the two things are out of phase or the extra distance that the bottom wave has to go is an integral number of wavelengths, including zero, right? So when it's zero, they're in phase. When the extra distance is exactly one wavelength, then they're in phase. And the extra distance, remember, is just delta x over d equal to sine theta. So for a given angle theta, the extra distance delta x divided by d is that angle sine theta. And so when the extra distance is equal to n lambda, where n is an integer, that means the, the two waves are an integer number out of phase from each other, uh, or in phase, right? They're integer phase difference. That means they're still in phase. One is one wavelength behind, exactly one wavelength, or two wavelengths behind. Whereas in contrast, the minima is when they're out of phase by half a wavelength. So that works, again, with n equals 0. That was the first case we did, right, where the extra distance is exactly half a wavelength. But when n equals 1, that means it's one and a half wavelengths. Well, so it's one wavelength, so they would be in phase, but it's another half wavelength, so that puts them out of phase again. So any time n plus 1 half, where n is an integer, that'll be a minimum. That'll be the, the angle of a minimum on this screen ahead. And so you get this pattern looking something like this. So what you're looking at here is what you would have seen in lab. A laser was sent through a, uh, a double slit. It might have been a multiple slit, but I'm looking at it. I'm thinking it was actually just a double slit. You'll notice in this, so there's these, these separated spots, and those are images of the laser spot. If the slit hadn't been there, there would have been one spot, the laser going through. But these two narrow slits, the wave-like behavior of the light causes it to diffract. And so the diffraction means off at these other angles, um, just like the, the circular waves coming out of that little gap in the stones on the lake, off at these other angles, if the angle is exactly right, so that the extra distance one of the two beams coming out of the slits has to go is exactly a wavelength, you'll get a bright spot. And so these distances here, and it looks like these bright spots are about half a millimeter apart. On this case, well, that's just the, uh, that would have been the H on the earlier diagram. How far away is the screen? You can use h divided by l. That'll give you the sine of the th angle theta. And then you can compare sine theta to delta x over d to figure out delta x, the path difference. How does that compare to lambda? And then this being red light, the lambda would have been somewhere around 600 nanometers. So you could have done all those calculations. And so then half a millimeter is exactly the right distance to have exactly the right angle to the screen from the slits for these two things to be in phase. So you get another white spot, but halfway in between, you get a dim spot. 
Um, so this series of spots, now you notice also that why are the spots at the center brighter than the spots further away? Well, there's that has to do with the width of the slit. Um, if the slit was infinitely narrow, then the spots would all be the same, but also no light would have gotten through, so it would have been really hard to see. When the slit actually has a finite width, it adds more complication to this, but we're not going to go into that here. So if you go back and you look at this slide, right, this plot of the intensity, each peak of those intensities corresponds to one of the spots you see in that image. Now, all that's wave-like behavior, so great. You see diffraction that, that confirms the wave model of light, and the wave model of light predicts this diffraction. Now, here's the thing, though, is that people who do these experiments really carefully in the lab, where they do shine really, 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 really dim light through slits, if light were a pure electromagnetic wave, right? If the electromagnetic wave model were capital T truth and always worked, if the model was applicable to however dim of light you had, then you should be able to just keep drifting down the intensity forever. And no matter how dim, a sufficiently sensitive detector, right? Now, it could be your detector has to be really good at seeing really dim light, um, which, you know, often things get too dim to see. But, all right, we're ma imagining the best possible detector. It should still be able to see the diffraction pattern if light is nothing but a wave, because waves always will diffract like that. But here's what you really see. Second paragraph here. You turn down the intensity enough... And that, what is that intensity? Well, so the, the rate at which energy is going through the slits corresponds to just one photon at a time. You do not detect a continuous diffraction pattern. The photon just ends at one spot. You detect um, a ping when the photon reaches the diffraction screen. Right? Each photon is detected at just one place. And so that would be more like if you were bouncing baseballs through the two slits. Right? So if you just throw a baseball straight ahead, um, it's going to go straight ahead. But you imagine if you try and throw it through a narrow uh, doorway, a doorway that's mostly closed, there's an excellent chance it's going to bounce off the side of the doorway and go off at an angle. All right. And so, okay, so then <clears throat> that's what the photon's behaving like. It goes through the two slits, um, and then it goes off at some angle, and you just detect one photon. But here's the interesting thing, is that you let this go on long enough, one photon at a time, each time the photon's just in one place. If you keep track of all the places where the photons landed and you build up the the number of photons that landed at each spot along the screen, you get exactly the diffraction pattern you would expect from the wave theory. Now, how did we get this diffraction from the wave theory? We took the waves coming out of each of the two slits interfering with each other. So you had to have these two waves coming out interfering with each other. If you only send one photon through the thing at a time, you would think, well, it has to go through one slit or the other. And if it went through one slit or the other, well, then there's nothing for it to interfere with. And yet, you get exactly the same pattern as if one photon at a time, the photons were interfering with something. And so each photon interferes with itself. So there's this wacky thing going on where the photon, does it go through one slit or the other? The answer is, no, it doesn't it probabilistically goes through both slits. And this is very much in the same way as atomic orbitals. The electron is not at a place, but it has some probabilistic distribution of, of where it could be. It's the same thing with photons of light. So that's quantum indeterminacy. That's wacky stuff. So the light particle duality, or sorry, the wave particle duality with light, it shows up in this diffraction pattern because you get wave behavior with the diffraction pattern. But if you do it one photon at a time, you don't see a really, 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 really dim diffraction pattern. You see um, at your detector, one photon hits, and bing, bing, you get a little spot of light there very briefly as one photon hits. But over time, if you keep track of where the photons hit over time, the probabilities of where they will have hit will exactly match the diffraction pattern. So it's behaving both like a particle and like a wave at the same time. Particle, because it hits one point on the screen. Each photon hits one point on the screen when you detect it. It's at a place, but over time, the probability of where the photons will have gone matches the wave theory. That's really kind of weird. So the models of light that we have in physics is classical electrodynamics, and that's what we've talked around all semester. Light, it's, light is waves of electric and magnetic fields, and it works really well when the intensity and the interactions are such that you deal with lots of photons at once, right? So the amounts of energy are much greater than HC over lambda. And remember, that's a really small amount of energy right? Um, like 10 to the minus 20 or 10 to the minus 19th joules, something like that. 
or 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 17, whatever. It's a really small amount of energy. So as long as you have, and so if it was delivering that much energy per second, that would be like a 10 to the minus 17 watt light bulb. And nobody has those, right? You have 100 watt light bulbs or something like that. Um, or at least you did back when they were incandescent. And most of that energy was going off in infrared and was wasteful, but now we have LED lights and they're more like 10 watts, but whatever, it's still way bigger than 10 to the minus 17. Um, so there's a whole lot of photons there. So if the amount of energy is much greater than HC over lambda, the electromagnetic theory works really well. Um, but photons, it's a completely different model of light. Light comes in discrete packets of energy. Each packet has energy HC over lambda. And if you want a certain amount of energy, you have to do it by adding up your packets. And that means energy has to come in steps. And this works when you're dealing with light being absorbed or emitted by individual atoms or molecules, or sometimes just the structure of a crystal. Because those interactions, as I told you before, happen one photon at a time. Now, quantum field theory really is the best we can do is it seems to be a, a fundamental theory. We haven't really found it break. There are some theoretical considerations in physics that give us problems. Um, really is the quantum photo, photon theory of light. You can show mathematically that in the limit when you have a huge numbers of photons and when things are not too small and it's not interacting with one atom at a time, that it predicts exactly the same thing as classical electrodynamics. And classical electrodynamics is much easier to work with in the cases where you have high intensities. So that's why we still use it. It's an extremely effective model. Remember, science is about using the models. Just a little interlude. 351 students kept agitating me to show them to kitties. And you guys haven't seen it yet, so I figured if you needed to see the kitty. This is Novella. Say hello, Novella. Yeah, she's a sweet kitty. Well, that's all right. Now, the topic is atoms and photons. So we want to talk about atoms. And uh, what matters in atoms? Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask a nuclear physicist, it's the nucleus. But if you ask a chemist, really, it's the electrons. And what the nucleus is, is a big, massive, anchored thing that provides an electric field, electromagnetic field, that holds electrons in place. But what is chemistry? Well, making and breaking bonds, all of that, it's all about moving the electrons around. It's how are the electrons shared? between different atoms and uh, things like that. So electrons are important. But instead of electrons, I want to talk about a macroscopic spinning ball. Right? This is your baseball here. Um, and it's rotating. And if you remember when we talked about angular momentum last semester, the way you figure out the angular momentum vector, so here notice this ball is rotating. Uh, and if I hold up my right hand, right, it's rotating sort of like this. So my fingers are curling around the direction it's rotating, right? My fingers point along the arrow of rotation. My thumb points along the conventional uh, angular momentum vector. So we would say in this case, it has an angular momentum vector pointing up. Well, so what are the properties of this ball? Imagine it's a baseball, although I want it to be a really smooth ball. So it's a bowling ball whose holes have been filled in. Or it's just, it's a ball, right? You can handle the idea. Well, it has some intrinsic properties that just are part of what makes it the ball that it is. It has the mass that it has. It has a moment of inertia. You may remember from last semester. For a uniform sphere, that would be 2 fifths mr squared, where m is the mass, r is the radius. Um, one of the other properties of the ball I didn't write down, actually, is the radius, the size of it. Um, that's part of what makes the ball what it is. And there's other things like its color. It's a red ball. Um, you could have its material. It's a rubber ball. It's a metal ball, that kind of thing. Um, and then it's charge, how much electric charge is on it. All right, well, that I have, the, I have the dotted arrow next to the charge, and I'll explain that in a moment. So these are sort of intrinsic properties, what makes it the ball. But there's also state properties that you can change these things that don't really change its identity as, as the ball. Right? If you change the mass of the ball, it's a different ball now. It's a lighter ball. And if you change the color, it's a different colored ball. And if you change the moment of inertia, it's now a hollow ball instead of a solid ball. It's not the same ball. But if you put it in a different place, it's the same ball, just in a different place. So we have state properties. What's the state of the system? Like basically, what's its deal right now? And that could be its position. Where is it? And its velocity. Which way is it going and how fast? And its angular momentum. How much is it spinning? Um, is it spinning a lot? Then its angular momentum is big. And the components of its angular momentum. Right? Angular momentum is a vector. And a vector has a magnitude and a direction. So how? So angular momentum, where I put the absolute value signs on it, that's the magnitude. And then how do you say the direction? Well, remember, with vectors, one way is you just list three components. So if the z component is big and the x and y components are both zero, it's pointing in the z direction. If the z component and the y component are the same, 
and the x component is zero, then the vector is pointing at a 45 degree angle between the z and y directions. So what the components are determine which way it's spinning. And you can imagine, and you have done, a ball, you can make it spin in any direction, in any speed. You can have a ball that's still, and then give it a little twirl, and now it's rotating. Uh, and now twirl it in a different direction. It's rotating in a different direction, right? All these things. And actually, and this is why charge, um, you also can just add more charge to a ball. We did this in lab with tape, right? By tearing tape away from each other, you added more charge to some pieces of tape than other pieces of tape. So that might actually be a state property. Does it really identify the tape when its charge is different? It's still a piece of tape, right? So that's why I charge actually, I have it as an intrinsic property, but I drew a line over. It's really more of a state property for macroscopic spinning ball. All right, so, and the reason, none of this should be surprising. All of this should just be, duh, he's telling me about a ball and that it could be at a place and have a velocity, and I knew that, and it has a mass. Why are you telling me these things? Because I wanted to lay it out and be really explicit about this because we want to talk about how electrons are different. An electron has a number of intrinsic properties. One is its mass. All right, well, that's like a ball has a mass. It's charge, so this is why I listed charge as an intrinsic property. All electrons have exactly the same charge. And we use the letter E for the charge, well, the fundamental charge, really electrons have a charge of negative E. Well, okay, that's not so surprising, Matt. Each electron has the same mass, each electron has the same charge. Here's something that is weird. All electrons have exactly the same total angular momentum. And the value of that angular momentum is root three divided by two times this Planck's con this thing called H bar, Notice that's an H with a bar on it. That's just Planck's constant, the H we had before, divided by 2 pi, it is now H bar. H and H bar. Physicists use both because we couldn't decide which one we like better. I think most of us like H bar better, but H is sometimes convenient, so we still use it. Anyway, but this is the thing. Every single electron, you measure its angular momentum, the magnitude of that angular momentum is always exactly this value. And that is different from a ball, right? You have a macroscopic ball, you can make it stop spinning or you can spin it faster. Electrons, they're all spinning the same rate. You can't stop electrons from spinning. You can't spin them faster. The angular momentum of the electron is an intrinsic property, not a state property. And that's kind of wacky. And then another thing, um, electrons do have a magnetic dipole moment. Um, if you have, you know, how do you make magnetic dipoles usually? Well, the way we talked about it in this class is you run current through a little loop of wire. That'll make a magnetic dipole. And you can run more or less current to get a bigger or smaller dipole. <clears throat> well, electrons, they all have exactly the same dipole moment. And there's various other quantum properties we won't really talk about that are part of what defines an electron. All electrons are identical. Every single electron, all these properties are exactly the same as each other. Well, okay, so that total angular momentum of, an elect of all electrons is exactly the same, and that's a little weird. You wouldn't expect that from a ball, but there's an even weirder thing, and that is even though the total angular momentum is the same, it's like, all right, well, let's just suppose I've got balls and they're all spinning, but I could still turn the ball and orient it so its spin is pointing in any direction. And again, remember back at this picture, when I say the spin is pointing, what I mean is the direction of the angular momentum vector. So it's spinning around like this, it's pointing that way. So if you were looking straight down at it, you would describe it as spinning counterclockwise, right? And then the vector is pointing out at you. Right? So when I say which way is the spin pointing, I mean that vector along the axis that you use the right hand rule. So for electrons, um, you would think maybe, oh, you can just make the spin point in any direction, but it turns out you can't. And remember, the direction of a vector affects its components. It turns out if you measure the z component of angular momentum for electron, every time you do it, you get either plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2, never anything else. All right? Again, think about the spinning ball. If you have a, a ball that's spinning and you turn it on its side, so its angular momentum vector is pointing directly in the x direction, it would have zero z spin angular momentum, right? But electrons can't do that. Electrons never have zero component of z spin, which means you can't orient the, uh, the, um, you can't orient the electrons spin any direction you want. It, it, it just doesn't work. And that's really weird, right? That's counterintuitive. Um, but it's nature, right? That's the way things work. And this um, this leads to a whole bunch of stuff, including things you've heard of, like the Pauli exclusion principle. The fact that you can put two electrons in one orbital is intimately linked to the fact that there are two different possible Z spin states for the electron. Right? So electron spin is quantized, meaning it comes in steps of H bar. And here's H bar, H over two pi, right? That 
And there's only two possibilities, and one is h bar bigger than the other. And those two possibilities are plus one half and minus one half, right? So one is one bigger than the other. Um, electron spin, all electrons have the same total angular momentum, but then their z component is quantized. It's either plus or minus, plus one half or minus one half in units of h bar, never anything in between. That's weird. That's how they work. Well, there's even weirder things about electron angular momentum. And to get to that, we're going to take an aside into the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle for most of the world is mostly there to make lame physics jokes about the man Heisenberg not being sure about things. Uh, and that's not at all what it's about. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is not really about certainty um, because certainty suggests how well you know something. But really, it's about nature, not about how well we know something. It's about ontology, not epistemology. But we're going to use the word uncertainty. Um, it's a fundamental uncertainty. So when I say delta x here is the uncertainty in position, and we're just doing the x component of position. Um, so that's some particle, an electron, whatever. Um, it's at some position. Let's go ahead and call it x equals 0. But there's an uncertainty it's in its position. Now, you get this with measurements. Right? Imagine a ruler. You can't measure something perfectly with a ruler. Um, if your ruler is marked down to the millimeter, you're not going to be able to measure to the micrometer with that ruler. Right? Again, you, you go, you look, and the little bands on the on the ruler are probably a quarter of a millimeter thick. Uh, and how do you decide if you're at the middle or the edge? And then if you look really close, it's a little bit ragged. So with a ruler, you can measure down to maybe half or a quarter of a millimeter if you're really careful, but no better than that. That's a measurement uncertainty. And that really is what you know or what you don't know. Right? You can only measure something so well based on the equipment you have. This uncertainty is different. This is a fundamental uncertainty. It's not that you don't know exactly where the electron is. It's that the electron isn't at a position, but it has a built-in uncertainty, a built-in non-definiteness to its position. And then delta x tells you how indefinite it is. Really, all you can say about an electron is that, well, it's at x equals zero within delta x. It doesn't have a more precise position than that. And again, it's not just because you can't measure it. It just doesn't have it. And then likewise, delta p, same thing with momentum. So if the electron's going off to the right, you would say that its momentum is positive, And then it's the mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron. And, and you feel good about that. Well, mass of the electron is well known. What that means is the velocity of the electron also has some intrinsic uncertainty. It's not that you don't know how fast it's going. It's that it doesn't have an exact speed, but the speed of the electron is probabilistically in some range. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says the product of these two uncertainties um, is got to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2, where again, h bar is the Planck's constant we talked about before, divided by 2 pi. Right. Now, again, that's a really small number. So if you want to measure things to within millimeters, like 10 to the minus 3 meters, and then millimeters per second, so 10 to the minus 3 meters per second, um, well, 10 to the minus 3 times 10 to the minus 3, that would give you, and suppose it's an object of, I don't know, a gram. So 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, so that's another 10 to the minus 3. We're down to 10 to the minus 9 kilogram meters per second times meters. If you're going to have the momentum and position of an object, how well do you want to know it? You want to know it within a millimeter. You want to know its speed within a millimeter per second, and it's a 1 gram object. 10 to the minus 9, and that is um, like 25 orders of magnitude bigger than this quantum limit. This is why you've don't notice this quantum limit in everyday life because the ability you have to estimate sizes of things um, in your everyday macroscopic life is nowhere near the quantum limit. Um, but it really matters when you get inside atoms and things like that. So some of the consequences of this is that suppose you actually really do know the position of an electron perfectly. I really know this electron is at x equals zero. That tells you that delta px has to be huge. And all right, so maybe it's not. Maybe it's just delta x is really, really small, like 10 to the minus 70 meters or something. You've really localized this thing. The uncertainty in delta px has to be giant so that the product of really small and something else gets you at least h bar over 2. And that means a very small time later, you no longer know where it is because the uncertainty in its velocity was huge, so now you don't know where it is anymore. Right? In contrast, suppose you know exactly the speed of an electron. If you really know exactly the speed, you don't know where it is. That's a little like a wave if you think about it, right? Where is the wave? Well, it's spread out over the 
surface. You know, if I, I can't really pick a spot for it. It's spread out over the surface of the water, but maybe we know how fast it's going. So if you have an electron and you know perfectly its momentum, you know nothing about its position. You can know one or the other. You can't know both perfectly. And practice, really, though, you just you have some uncertainty in both. And then the uncertainties have to obey this um, property here. So that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's kind of a, it's a bizarro thing, but it's the fundamental basis of a lot of what goes into quantum mechanics. A lot of what goes into quantum mechanics are these two things. Like on this previous page, stuff is quantized. There are certain values that some things, like, say, Z component of angular momentum, will have. Um, and the name quantum mechanics comes from the fact that there are quantum steps. All of this is very much like that those waves on a string I was telling you earlier, where there's only specific wavelengths that will fit if you have a string fixed at two ends. Well, nature behaves like when you get things close together and really small, like there's stuff that's fixed, sort of, sort of, just an analogy. And then the second thing is, is this uncertainty thing, quantum indeterminacy, the fact that things aren't at positions and things don't have exact momentums, but they have a probability distribution. And the uncertainty represents the size of that probability distribution. So coming back, quantum uncertainty and angular momentum. How does this apply to the angular momentum of an electron? Well, again, classical physics, you have a macroscopic spinning ball. You can know exactly how fast it's spinning to, to any classical uh, precision you want. So when I say perfectly star, really, that just means with any conceivable measuring device that would matter for a baseball, um, any uh, I mean, conceivable. It's a tough word, but whatever. Baseballs, the way classical physics describes the world and the way that it works for baseballs within anything you would care, you can know exactly how fast it's spinning and exactly what direction it's spinning in. Um, and these are the continuous variables. You can speed it up a very tiny amount or slow it down a very tiny amount. You can bring it to zero if you want. Um, so knowing exactly how fast it's going and exactly what direction, that's the same as knowing all three components. Quantum physics, electrons are different. It turns out, first of all, you can know the total angular momentum, and you can only know one component of angular momentum. So if you know the z angular momentum perfectly, the x and y components of angular momentum are completely uncertain. Now for electrons, it's whatever direction you pick, you either get plus one or minus one. If you know that the electron plus z is plus one, then you don't know anything about its y. If you have an electron, whose uh, angular momentum, you've just measured it, and its z angular momentum is plus one half h bar. If you then measure the y angular momentum of that electron, you have a 50% chance of getting plus and a 50% chance of getting minus, and the electron doesn't even have a definite y angular momentum in that case. So only one component plus the total uh, angular momentum can be known or even have a definite value at once. Right. Whereas in classical physics, all three components have a definite value. And if the three components have a definite value, you can calculate the magnitude. So the magnitude has a definite value. Quantum physics, the magnitude, and one component is definite. Everything else is indefinite. It's wacky. But that, again, Pauli exclusion principle. Two electrons per state. If you could know all of x, y, and z, there would be eight different possibilities, right? So for z plus... And y plus, you could have x plus and minus. And then for z plus and y minus, you could have x plus and minus. Add up all the possibilities, there would be eight different possibilities. But you don't fit eight electrons in one orbital. You only fit two because there's only two different projections that are distinct. Uh, or you can only, only one projection can be definite at a time. So there's really only two distinct projection states. Since all electrons have exactly the same total spin angular momentum, there's only two spin angular momentum states that are even possible for electrons. Very different from classical physics. So electron versus macroscopic spinning ball. This is what fundamentally is different about quantum mechanics than classical physics. This gets at some of it. Macroscopic spinning ball can spin faster or slower. Every electron is exactly the same. And then I use S for spin angular momentum because electrons can also orbit. You've heard of orbitals. Every electron has exactly the same spin angular momentum. For a macroscopic spinning ball, you can know all the spin components at the same time x, y, and z. Just figure out which way is the vector pointing. For electron, only one component of spin is definite. So if z is definite, x and y are completely indeterminate. Um, spin is quantized. So the component itself is z. You measure spin z, you get plus one half or minus one half in h bar, whereas it can point in any direction. That's the same as saying all the components can be known for a 
uh, macroscopic spinning ball. And then if instead of spin, we talk about position, um, within the ability to measure that anybody would ever care about in classical physics, it, you can perfectly know the position and velocity of a ball. And we've been treating particles like this since the beginning of physics 141, where it has a position and it has a particle. That's how it works in classical physics. In contrast, electrons, there's a joint uncertainty between position and momentum, that they're their position is just, it doesn't have a definite position and a definite momentum. There is some fundamental indefiniteness to where the electron is. It's not just how well you know it, but even where it is, is a probability distribution, not a specific value. And then, of course, macroscopic spinning balls have a size, measure the radius. Electrons, as best we can tell, don't have any size to them. They're a point in space that has properties associated with it. That's kind of wacky. Of course, you don't ever localize them, right? Because there's always an uncertainty in their position. So, so, but, but there are things like protons that do have a size. Um, and nuclei have a size and atoms have a size. Electrons seem to be points. Now, string theory would suggest otherwise, but who knows if that's right. Anyway, so that's all for now. We'll talk more about atoms and photons next time in particular. How do atoms actually interact with photons will be one of the big topics for next time. This time, it was more about what's the worldview of quantum mechanics that gives us and what do electrons look like in that worldview. That's all for now. Mm -hmm.